It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Andrew Womack, and we're going to be discussing his Bible commentary titled Romans, Paul's Masterpiece on Grace. Andrew, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. Welcome back to the show. It's a blessing to be back with you, Sean. You're a blessing. Well, uh, first things first, Andrew, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, how God has used the book of Romans in your life. Obviously, to take on writing a commentary, that's a whole adventure in, in, its, uh, in itself. But, but for you, how has the book of Romans been special? You know, when I first got really turned on to the Lord, just a few months after that, I heard a man say that if you could understand the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, it would totally change your life and it would produce maturity. And so that grabbed my attention and I started reading it. And I would say it was at least um, 15 years or maybe 20 years before I felt like I really began to have a handle on it. And of course, I'm still learning, but I really do believe that it is like foundational. This is the gospel 101. And so it's made a huge impact on my life. Well, and I want to pull a little bit more on the, that thread of the gospel one-on-one. Uh, on the back cover copy in big letters, it says the gospel as you've, as you've never seen it before. So we've got the four gospels, but what are, what are some of the ways that the book of Romans fleshes out the, the gospel, helps us to understand things maybe in a way that we don't grasp uh, without what Paul's sharing here? It starts in Romans 1, 16 and 17, and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And today we use the word gospel to refer to nearly anything having to do with religion. But in Paul's day, it was a radical term. Matter of fact, I actually read a commentary that said outside of the New Testament, the word for gospel, which I'm not going to try and pronounce it in Greek, but they said that that Greek word was so rare that there's only two instances of that word being used outside of the New Testament. And so it means literally good news, but it really was a hyperbole, and it was speaking about nearly too good to be true news. It was just over-the-top good news. And in the Jewish religion, it had degenerated to a place to where the law was just condemning. They had rituals. And they had uh, so many restrictions. They even counted how many steps you could take on a Sabbath day. And it was just so condemning that there was nothing in the Jewish religion that was good news. So for Paul to come along and say, I'm not ashamed of telling people about the good news, that was a radical, radical statement that I think is lost on a lot of New Testament people because it's become a cliche for us. But it really is talking about that God has paid our total price for everything through Jesus. And all we contribute is our sin and then our faith, receiving it as a gift. And uh, that's what Paul does in a masterful way in this teaching in the book of Romans. And, and I would venture to say that Romans is probably not the favorite book of most Christians today because they don't understand grace. And if you don't understand grace, well, then you're going to be locked out of the book of Romans because that is the whole theme of it. Matter of fact, the word grace and gospel are used interchangeably in like Acts 20, uh, 20, 24 and Galatians chapter one. You can't talk about the gospel without talking about the grace of God. And there's a lot of people today that will say, you know, I'm preaching the gospel. And then they'll turn around and say, you're going to hell, repent or hell, stern or burn. And they'll say that's the gospel. Well, those things are true that we are sinners and there is a hell and we've got to repent, but that's not good news. And so the good news is that even though we have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God has provided everything through Jesus and all we've got to do is believe and receive or doubt and do that. And in terms of uh, putting together this commentary, was that something you'd always wanted to do? Did you have people requesting that you put together a commentary? How did you get started down the road of compiling all this information together? I actually started producing a commentary in the early 1980s, and it was a hard copy edition that we call Life for the Day. And I spent about an hour and a half per verse going through the Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then when I started on television in 2003, I just ran out of time. 
to do that. But what my uh, staff, I kept writing footnotes, but I was doing it on my computer. And my staff, I forget the exact timing of this, but it was around, uh, I don't know, maybe 2012. They took all of the footnotes that I had written along with the published uh, hard copy uh, commentary that I had written on uh, Matthew through um, Titus. And they put all of this together and we call it a living commentary because I, I, I wrote footnotes last night and I'm still going through and I've now written footnotes on 25,826 verses in the Bible. And so it's a living commentary. It's still updating. And this book that we have takes my living commentary on uh, Romans, and it also takes my teaching. Some of these footnotes on Romans were written as many as 20 years ago. And so it'll have footnotes from up to 20 years ago, plus my current teaching on it, and it uh, puts them together. And there's some overlap. But I never say it the same way twice. It's just really good. It's got the printed text of Romans, then my living commentary, which is the digital commentary, and then the written uh, thing that I've taught and somebody tra- transcribed it from my teachings. And all of this together, it's a 420-page book, and it's powerful. When, it, when we use the word commentaries, I, I think the average uh, Christian doesn't always think that's something they should have uh, in their personal library. but. In this context, I'm curious, who's the audience you have in mind? Is this going to be fruitful for both pastors and leaders, but also the average layperson attending church as well? I really think it's good for anybody. You know, the typical commentary, I'm sure that you've studied commentary, Sean, and the typical commentary goes into Greek, Hebrew, it goes into history, and it's real cerebral, and it's for the serious, serious student. Well, I've got that in there. I've got Greek and Hebrew words to find, but I'm not real, I'm not real intellectual myself. And so it's done in a layman's type of way. Plus, a lot of things in there are just my practical uh, things that God has shown me. And I put in personal examples and uh, things like this. So it's a combination. It's got the uh, intellectual or the st- studious type of things in it but it's primarily written, written for a lay person. So I think that a person in ministry would certainly benefit, but anybody would benefit from this. It's In some ways, it's kind of a, a combination between a devotional and a commentary, and it's it's really good. And uh, let's say somebody goes out, they, they pick up the new commentary, and they sit down, work their way through the commentary right alongside their Bible, and they get all the way through the Book of Romans. What do you hope they discover along that journey? Well, they will definitely either get a revelation of God's grace or they will just reject the truths that Paul is presenting. Because Paul, I mean, I call this the book of Romans, and then the subtitle is Paul's masterpiece on grace. He is so detailed. You know, like the book of Galatians, he's teaching on grace, but in in Galatians, he's like mad. He's mean with it. He says, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Christ is going to profit you nothing. And he says, if anybody's preaching something different, let them be accursed. So Galatians is making the same points, but it is in a in-your-face type of way. Romans is just a real methodical uh, teaching on grace. And he goes through Abraham and uh, David to show you that they had a revelation of grace. And that's the only way that they were accepted. And then in Romans chapter uh, five, he, he, I mean, it's just powerful talking about eight. Chapter six is one of the things that uh, Paul does that really needs to be said because he, he comes to this conclusion, Romans 6, 1, about, uh, you know, what should we say? Does grace allow us just to go live in sin? And then he says, God forbid And he starts showing you why grace teaches you to live holy. So it balances and puts all of this together. And uh, in my estimation, it's it's a masterpiece. I couldn't improve on it. I don't think anybody could improve on it. He was inspired. It'll it'll change his lives. And if uh, people really appreciate what they encounter in this Romans commentary, do you have any other commentaries that you've done as well? Well, like I said, I've got a commentary on the entire Bible. There's 31,000 verses in the Bible, and I've written commentary on nearly 26,000. 
So, uh, I mean, I go from Genesis to Revelation, and there's just very few places uh, that I don't have some type of commentary. And I mean, it's basically, I've been seeking the Lord with my whole heart for 53 years. And so it's 53 years of my personal Bible study uh, just put down on paper. And I have a lot of people that tell me, you know, in the long run, I believe that that's going to be the greatest contribution I make is to put down these things and just commentary on the scripture. Some of the things that I've studied, like in Daniel chapter one, verse two, it took me probably a week to write that footnote because what I did was go back and show that there were actually four times that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. And I went into history and, and showed the times and the dates. And without you studying outside of the Bible and putting those things together, it's a little confusing. Because you'll see Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, and then he comes back and conquers it again. And so anyway, it, there's things like that in there. I go through the Herods and explain all of the different Herods that are used in the New Testament and when they ruled and what the end result of them was. And those are things that you just don't get by reading the Gospels only. So it's really good. And Andrew, for the listeners and viewers who would like to connect with you, find out more about this commentary, find out more about your ministry, where do we discover you on the web? You go to awmi.net, and uh, we have everything there, my television programs, all kinds of things. We got over 200,000 hours of free teaching on my website. If people listen 24 hours a day, it'd take them 20 (laughs) hours to go through it all. So anyway, I encourage them to check out awmi.net. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Andrew and pick up your very own copy of this new book as well. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Andrew Womack. Once again, our book today was Romans, Paul's Masterpiece on Grace. And for more on Andrew, this book, and really everything related to his ministry, you can head on over to his website. You can find that at awmi.net. And Andrew, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's always an honor. It's always a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you, Sean. It's real pleasant.